Now we came to the high point of this course, the discussion of Shor's algorithm. Shor's algorithm is the quantum algorithm for integer factorization, and it solves the following problem. So given n a product of uh, two large secret primes, determine p and q such that n is equal to p times q. So we're given the product of uh, two primes and we need to determine the primes. So as uh, we said, so we are going to use group theory to do this. So we consider the group of multiplicative remainders mod n. And uh, we know that this group is isomorphic to the product of uh, Zp multiplicative and uh, Zq multiplicative. Right? Of course, uh, this factorization is not known to us uh, because um, to have this factorization we need to know P and Q. But um, we know that such factorization exists. And uh, then from here we um, know that the order of the group or the number of elements of the group so order of G is M, which is um, the product of orders of these groups. And so here P and Q are primes. So uh, the group of multiplicative uh, remainders mod a prime has order P minus one. So because we only need to remove the zero remainder. So the order of this uh, product is uh, P minus one times Q minus one. So if we can determine the value of m, so we can find p and q. So as we said that we can form a quadratic relation uh, because if we know the product n p times q and this number m, then we also know p plus q. And then we can form uh, a quadratic equation and the roots of this quadratic equation will be uh, our secret primes p and q. So if we have m and n, then uh, this factorization is uh, easy to obtain. So now let's uh, talk how we can find m. We can uh, Determine M if we can we are able to find orders of uh, elements in uh, this group, right? And uh, so this is done with the help of Lagrange's theorem. So Lagrange's theorem says that the order of uh, an element little g in the group G is um, a divisor of uh, the order of G. So by finding orders of elements, we will obtain divisors uh, of the order of the group. And in this case, uh, divisors uh, of this integer M. And uh, so now let us show that if we are able to find sufficiently many divisors of uh, integer M, then we can determine M. Let us look at the following example. So let's take uh, two primes. Um, P is uh, 36,013 and Q is 51,199. 
So these primes are by no means large, but um, so they, they will just allow us to work out this uh, small example here. So we also interested in numbers p minus 1 and q minus 1 because they determine the orders uh, of the groups. And uh, so here we um, uh, give uh, factorizations of uh, p minus 1 and q minus 1. Well, we can do these factorizations only because this is a small example. In general, um, well, even p and q are secret to us, so, so this information is uh, not attainable. But uh, suppose uh, we are able to compute orders of elements, and I take um, as elements just more or less random elements in the group. Um, we take g equals 2, so this is the remainder 2 mod n, 3 mod n, 5 mod n, and 7 mod n. And suppose uh, we are able to compute uh, the orders of these elements. Again, uh, for these orders, we will not have factorizations, but uh, having this factorization is convenient just to see what's uh, going on in the background. So now, once we computed orders of elements, so we can calculate the least common multiple of uh, these orders of g1, g2, g3, and g4. Well, in this case, we have four elements. And uh, so this uh, least common multiple can be calculated, uh, well, if we can calculate GCDs uh, using Euclidean algorithm, we can also compute LCMs because there is a very simple relation between GCD and LCM. So to compute this least common multiple, we don't need to know these factorizations. But uh, since um, these factorizations are available to us, so let's just compute this LCM using uh, this uh, factorization. So clear, clearly we'll have least common multiple will be 2 squared times 3 times 7 times uh, 23 times 53 and uh, times uh, 3001. Now, this number is not equal to n, to m, which is the product of p minus 1 times q minus 1, right? So, for example, in the product, we will have uh, 3 squared and uh, 2 cubed, um, right? So, in fact, what this number is, and this is what we are likely to get, is we are likely to get um, the, not the product, but least common multiple of uh, p minus 1 and q minus 1. And in fact, it's easy to see that uh, the order in, in this setting, when we have a Cartesian product of two groups, then the order of uh, every element is uh, not uh, the divisor, not only the divisor of the order of the Cartesian product, but it's also a divisor of least common multiple of the orders of two constituents. So this means that we can never, um, as an order of an element, we can never obtain something which is bigger than this. But the point here is that uh, this is uh, not too far off from m. So typically this uh, will differ from m by a small factor. And uh, this factor can be determined uh, since we know the order of magnitude of uh, m, right? So, so what we can say is, um, so, okay, so let's uh, call this uh, number r here. So, so what we need to find is uh, we need to find m over r. But, um, so, because if we have r and m over r, then uh, we can recover m. But this is equal to uh, n over r times uh, m over n, right? So, but, um, so what do we have? So, n here is pq and m is uh, p minus 1 times q minus 1. So what we see is that the ratio n over m is uh, very close to be 1. So this means that m over r is approximately equal to n over r. 
right? And so if we have R and uh, we have N, right? So then uh, in this case, so this number is uh, something like 6.00028, from which we conclude that uh, M is equal to 6R, right? So, so the conclusion here is the following, that if we are able to calculate orders of elements uh, in the group, then by taking several elements and computing least common multiple of uh, their orders, so we will be able to determine the order of the group, so in, uh, in this way. And uh, once we have the order of the group and uh, the product n of pq, so then we can determine p and q, and we are done. Now we reduced um, the problem of integer factorization to the following problem. So problem given a large integer n and uh, a remainder g in uh, zn multiplicative, so an invertible remainder mod n, determine the order of g. So that is the smallest number L such that so G to the power of L is uh, equal to one mod N. And here, of course, uh, L is uh, a natural number and uh, L is uh, greater or equal to one. Right, so this is uh, what uh, we need to determine. So, so we need to be able to find orders uh, of elements in uh, large multiplicative groups. So the idea of Shor's algorithm is, uh, so construct powers of G where we take, um, well, g to the power of zero, g to the power of one, g squared, and so on. So, and we go to g to some power s, where s is, uh, has order of magnitude of n squared. Now, clearly, l is uh, less than n, so, and uh, so if s has order of magnitude of n squared, so this means that uh, this sequence is uh, going to be periodic. And uh, so it will repeat itself several times, right? And uh, so what we are looking for, so the period of this sequence is precisely the order of uh, this uh, element. And so our goal is to determine the period of uh, this periodic sequence. And uh, we're going to do this uh, using uh, Fourier transform. Now, the first order of business is to determine how much um, space do we need. So how many qubits we're going to use for this algorithm. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to fix little n such that capital N is between 2 to the power of N and 2 to the N minus 1. So in other words, so capital, the big N is uh, an uh, N-bit integer. So this tells us that um, capital N as well as all remainders mod N can be um, represented as uh, n-bit uh, integer strings. For our periodic sequence, we also need to keep track of the exponent. And uh, the exponent uh, of uh, powers of g goes to up to n squared. So, and uh, n squared is an uh, 
2n bit integer. So altogether, we'll be using a 3n qubit space. And we're going to write down basis vectors in this space as uh, k tensor h, where this k is going to be a, a 2n bit um, string, and h is going to be an n bit string. Now let us present the steps uh, of the Shor's algorithm. So step zero. So initialize quantum state to zero tensor zero. Right. So here, uh, so the first zero is a two n bit zero, and the second is an n bit zero. Then uh, step one. Apply Adamar's transformation H to each of uh, the first two N bits. So what are we going to get? So we're going to get um, the following expression. So we are going to get so h times uh, zero. So now this is a single zero. Tensor h times single zero. Tensor h times zero. Right. So this is for two n bits. And uh, so we just don't touch. The remaining n bits. So if we do this, so when we apply h to zero, we get one over square root of two zero plus one over square root of two one tensor with um, the same expression in the first um, um, in the first um, bits. And uh, so tensor with uh, the last n bits with uh, that are zero, and uh, so this will uh, give us uh, the following expansion. So this will be um, one over two to the power of n. Sum k goes from zero to two to the power of two n minus one, and uh, so here we will just get k. And all this is tensor with zero, right? So basically, we obtain here a superposition of all possible inputs, right? So, so when we expand this, so here we are going to get all possible binary strings of uh, length two n uh, with equal coefficients, and these uh, equal coefficients are easily seen to be one over two to the power of n. And uh, so then we interpret our first two n bits as an input, and uh, the last n bits as output. So and here we prepare the state where we have a superposition of all possible inputs uh, that that are taken, and uh, so the output bits are initialized to zero. So the next step is uh, so run the classical. Computation or quantum implementation of the classical computation for the function so f of k is equal to g to the power of k mod n. Right. So here we fixed uh, n and we fixed an element g. And uh, so here we have such a classical function. So f of uh, an integer k is uh, g to the power of k mod n. 
and uh, so we treat the first two n bits as an input and the last uh, n bits as an output and the output fits uh, into n bits because we said that every remainder can be interpreted as an n bit expression. And uh, so as a result of this step, so here we know that uh, when we run a classical computation on a quantum computer, this is highly parallel. So this means that we can obtain the result at once for all possible inputs. And uh, so the state that we are going to get now will become 1 over 2 to the power of n. So the sum k goes from 0 to 2 to the power of 2n minus 1. And uh, so inputs are unchanged and the outputs will uh, correspond to the output of this function. So here we're going to get g to the power k mod n, right? So interpreted as an n bit string. So the next step will be measure the value of uh, the last n bits. So if observed value is h, then uh, the collapse state is uh, going to be uh, so uh, the sum of our k and uh, so k will be uh, between 0 and uh, 2 to the power of 2n. So we have k tensor h, right? So if h is the observed state, but uh, k are not going to be arbitrary here. So, so the k's that appear will in the sum will satisfy the property that g to the power k is equal to h mod n. Only these values of uh, k will survive. And uh, so then we need to also renormalize the this uh, sum and so this will be 1 over square root of L where L is the number of terms uh, in this sum. So after step 3, so we will get uh, a state which looks like this. On step 4, we apply quantum Fourier transform to the first two n bits. And uh, finally, in step five, measure the value of uh, the first two n bits. So, so if the observed value is r, then uh, running this algorithm several times but a small number of times, maybe like two or three or four. So we get um, several values, R1, R2, RT. Then um, from uh, these uh, integers, from this, we can uh, determine M which is the order of uh, this uh, element G that uh, we are using here. So, so basically we're going to see that from the output uh, of Shor's algorithm, so if we collect several of them, then we can determine the order of the group with high probability. Of course, so the quant any quantum algorithm is probabilistic, so we are not uh, 
ever guaranteed a certain result, but we are guaranteed to get the correct result with a high probability, and uh, so this is what we are aiming for. Now, these are the steps uh, of the Shor's algorithm. So next, we are going to discuss the steps in detail and uh, analyze them and analyze their complexity. So let us uh, look at step two, where we do a quantum implementation of a classical computation, right? So here on this step, we go from uh, one over two to the power n, the sum k goes from zero to two to the power two n minus one, k tensor with zero, to this one over two to the power n, the sum k goes from zero to two to the power two n minus one, and k tensor with g to the power k mod n. All right. So here the function that uh, we apply is f of k is uh, g to the power of k mod n. Now let us uh, think about the complexity of uh, this function. So how many elementary operations, so for example bit operations, do we need to carry out uh, to implement this function? So let's ask the question. So how many multiplications are required to compute g to the power of 1000? So the naive answer to this question is that one needs to, to carry out 999 multiplication. So we compute g, g squared, g cubed, g, g to the power 4, and so on. But um, so the clever answer to, to this it involves uh, um, binary expansion of 1000. So what can we say? What's 1000? So this is a decimal integer, right? So 10 cubed. What uh, is it uh, in binary? So this is um, 512 plus uh, 256 plus uh, 128 plus uh, 64 plus 32 plus 8. So then computation of g to the power 1000 runs in two stages. So first uh, we compute powers of g that corresponds to powers of 2. So we compute g squared and then uh, g to the power 4 which is g squared squared. And then g to the power 8 which is g to the power 4 squared. And uh, then we compute g to the power 16, g to the power 32, g to the power 64, g to the 128, g to the 256, and finally g to the 512. And after this we combine powers uh, of 2 according to this expansion to get g to the power 1000. So g to the power 1000 is equal to g to the 512 times g to the 256 plus g times g to the 128 times g to the 64 times g to the 32 times g to the power of 8. So, and then what we see is that the number of multiplications is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So, so the answer is that we need 14 multiplications. So which is uh, way better than uh, 999, right? And uh, so this means that we have a fast algorithm to compute very high powers of g. And uh, so basically even here we have the advantage because k is already written in binary. 
And uh, so implementing this uh, classical function when k is written in binary, so we already have a binary expansion, so that is um, fairly straightforward. So we will only need some auxiliary memory, but um, so this is a fast computation. And uh, so what we see is that computational complexity here is that uh, so we need basically um, uh, approximately 2n multiplications right uh, so here we see that if we have an n bit um, integer right so like 1000 is a 10 bit integer we need n minus 1 multiplication to compute uh, uh, g to the power which is a power of 2 and then we need less than n multiplication to assemble these uh, g's to the powers of 2 into the g to the power of k that we need. So we see that uh, we need uh, at most 2 to the power of n multiplications. And uh, so the, on each step we are going to take uh, the remainder mod n. And taking the remainder mod n is also a fairly fast uh, uh, operation. So, and, uh, so this will ensure that uh, our um, result of our computation always uh, stay within uh, um, n-bit size or maybe 2n-bit size. And uh, so typically, well, asymptotically, what we are going to get is we are going to get uh, about n-squared bit operations. because multiplication of uh, two n-bit integers uh, involves uh, n-bit operation itself. So this means that uh, at the bit level, so the complexity of uh, this classical function is uh, n-squared. So the advantage of uh, quantum computing is uh, that we can achieve massive parallelism in this computation in uh, a single run. So if we have a superposition of all possible inputs, then uh, we also get a superposition of uh, all possible outputs. Classically, this computation is impossible. So if we organize this computation as a sequential loop, then uh, for the size of integer that we are interested in, so the amount of calculations or the time required for this calculation will exceed the, the lifetime of the universe. As a result of uh, step two, we are going to get a huge, very long periodic sequence, but um, the problem is that we cannot uh, access the values uh, on this, uh, peri in this periodic sequence. So basically what we want to know is what's the smallest value L such that g to the power of L is uh, identity. And uh, so this is uh, not uh, available to us. And the only thing that we can do is we can do a measurement which uh, will give us a probabilistic output. And uh, this is exactly what we are going to do at step three. So our step three is measure the last n bits. And suppose the observed value is h. Now, so this h is um, going to be g to the power of k mod n for some value of k. So we also let us um, set, let us denote, so the order of g by little m. So this means that um, it's the smallest integer such that g to the power of m is equal to 1 mod n. Possibly, or there will be definitely several values of k, such that g to the power of k will give us the same element h. 
Now let us describe all values of k that are solutions of this equation, g to the power of k is equal to h. So let s be the smallest uh, natural number such that g to the power of s is equal to h mod n. So then all other solutions will be, well, will be s, s plus m, s plus 2m, and so on. Right, so because g to the power of m is 1, so if we multiply g to the power of s, which is h, by g to the power of m, we're still going to get h. And uh, so in this way, we're going to get all solutions. So this means that our collapsed state can be written as uh, the sum over j from uh, 0 to some value l. And here we're going to get s plus jm tensor with h. Right? Or maybe let's uh, put l minus 1 here so that we have l terms. And uh, so then the factorization here will be 1 over square root of L so that uh, it's normalized to, to 1. So this is the state that uh, we're going to get as a result of the step 3. So here we're going to get some periodic sequence uh, with now period M where M is the number that we seek. So M is the order of G. Again, this is something that uh, we don't uh, know. And the value of L here is approximately equal to uh, 2 to the power 2n divided by m, but m is unknown. So after the step 3, so the last n bits will not play any role. And uh, so basically we can forget about the last n bits and uh, work with uh, just uh, this expression here. So next we apply quantum Fourier transform to this state 1 over square root of L sum j goes from 0 to L minus 1 and so here we have s plus jm right so this uh, periodic uh, sequence and we apply the quantum Fourier transform to this uh, sequence. Now the output of uh, quantum Fourier transform will uh, be the following expression. So it will be the sum k goes um, from 0 to 2 to the 2n minus 1 and we have uh, Fourier coefficients f hat k times k. Let us give the formula for the Fourier coefficients. Now, the key observation about um, Fourier transform is that if input is periodic, and uh, so here, so our input is periodic with period m, right? So with period m, then uh, Fourier transform will have spikes. So, so here, so this is how a Fourier transform will look like. So we will have, uh, so with each periodic input, there is an associated frequency. So we can compute, uh, so the frequency omega 
and omega is equal to uh, n over m, right? So where n is the length, or in our case it's 2 to the power of 2n, and m is the period. So in this way we can comp compute uh, the um, uh, base frequency. So this is the base frequency of a periodic sequence. And so what we're going to observe is that we're going to observe a spike at omega. So then there will be another spike at 2 omega. And uh, so then there will be a spike at 3 omega. And so on, right? So then there will be another spike at 4 omega. And uh, so on. So, so this is how um, a typical Fourier transform of a periodic sequence will look like. And the idea here is that if we can capture the base frequency of our periodic sequence, then we can determine the period just uh, from this formula. Let us show that the Fourier transform of this state will indeed have uh, the following pattern. So we have a formula for the Fourier coefficient fk. So that is uh, equal to 1 over square root of n, sum a goes from 0 to n minus 1, and uh, so here we have the coefficient fa times e to the minus 2 pi i uh, ak over n. Now, in our case, so fa is equal to um, 0 if a is not equal to s plus jm. And it's equal to 1 over square root of l if a is equal to s plus jm for some j. So, so this sum, so if we drop the zero terms, then we get, well, n is uh, here is 2 to the power of 2n. So we get uh, 1 over 2 to the power of n times the sum. So now in this sum, from taking a summation in a, we can take now a summation in j. So we get the sum j goes from 0 to l minus 1. And uh, here we have 1 over square root of l. And uh, so then this is multiplied by e to the minus 2 pi i. Well, instead of a, we put s plus jm times uh, k over n. Now we want to evaluate this sum. So we get 1 over 2 to the power of n times square root of l times, uh, so I'm going to pull out the term with s. So e to the minus 2 pi i sk over n and uh, now times the sum j goes from 0 to l minus 1 and uh, here we have e to the minus 2 pi i m k over n all that raised to the power of j and so what we see is that here we have a geometric uh, series and we use a formula for the sum of uh, a geometric uh, progression so the sum j goes from 0 to l minus 1 x to the power of j is equal to x to the l minus 1 over x minus 1. So this gives us so 1 over 2 to the power of n times square root of l e to the minus 2 pi i sk over n times um, e to the minus 2 pi i m k l over n minus 1 over e to the 
minus 2 pi i m k over n minus 1. Now, we want to understand the magnitude of uh, this number, right? So this is the value of the Fourier coefficient f k hat. And we would like to understand for which values of k this number is um, large, right? Now, what um, do we know about this? So here, well, the first factor is uniform. It's the same factor for all coefficients. So it does not contribute to relative magnitude of these coefficients. So this uh, second factor has norm one, right? So because we know that norm of e to the i alpha is equal to one. So this uh, factor in the numerator is also quite bounded, right? So, so here for this numerator, norm does not exceed two. So because we have one and something of norm one. So this means that this um, numerator cannot be very large. So the conclusion is that this Fourier coefficient could become very large only when denominator is uh, very small. So if denominator becomes uh, close to zero, then uh, this um, Fourier coefficient will blow up and will become large. And this is the only way how this Fourier coefficient can possibly become large. So what we say is that f k hat is large if, so this denominator is close to zero. So that is e to the minus two pi i m k over n is close to one. Now, when uh, does the exponential close to one? when uh, it's uh, an integer multiple of two pi i. So this means that this is close to one if and only if when m k over n is um, close to an integer. Call this integer l. And then this uh, says that um, k is approximately equal to l times uh, n over m, right? And this is our l omega, right? So this tells us that uh, if we take omega to be n over m, then uh, the Fourier coefficient will be large if k is an integer multiple of uh, this base frequency omega. And uh, so what we see is that uh, Fourier coefficients will uh, indeed form this pattern. So we will have spikes that uh, go at uh, regular intervals that are integer multiples of the base frequency omega, which is n over m. These Fourier coefficients will uh, become much larger than uh, all other Fourier coefficients. And so the final step of uh, Shor's algorithm is uh, measure the value of uh, the first two n bits. And uh, suppose the observed value is R. We run Shor's algorithm several times. Generating values R1, R2, up to RT. So this t need not to be um, very large, so it could be like uh, um, five, some, something like that. From this picture, we know that uh, these values are all going to correspond to these spikes. So this means that uh, it's extremely likely they 
all uh, will be multiples uh, of the base frequency omega. And uh, of course, if we can determine the base frequency omega, then uh, the, um, we can determine the value of m from uh, this relation. So the problem here is uh, that uh, this omega is not an integer, right? So it's um, a, a fraction. And so this means that these observed values are not exactly multiples of omega, but they are approximately uh, multiples of omega. And uh, so to determine omega, which is uh, 2 to the power 2n over m, we use approximate GCD. So here is our problem. So we have um, a bunch of integers that are multiples uh, of uh, a real number which is not um, an integer. And so these are not exact multiples but approximate multiples. And uh, what we want is we want to determine this real number using this approximate GCD Euclidean algorithm. Let us uh, show an example how this can be done. Now example. Suppose we run Shor's algorithm for n, which is uh, 989. So this is a 10-bit integer. So this means that uh, the number of bits is equal to 10, right? And uh, so this means that uh, this the so this means that we need uh, a 30 qubit space to run uh, Shor's algorithm. And in this uh, algorithm. So we compute um, our periodic sequence of length, so where k goes from 0 up to 2 to the power 20 minus 1, right? And uh, so this number is about 1 million. So this means that uh, these r values that we observe are also um, between 0 and 1 million. Suppose uh, we run Shor's algorithm twice, and on the first run we observe this value, and on the second run we observe uh, this value. So these two values will correspond to uh, these spikes, and so this uh, means that these are approximate multiples of omega, which is uh, 2 to the power of 20 divided by m. Right, and uh, so this omega and m are to be determined, right? So we need to use these uh, two integers in order to determine the value of m. So our idea is to think that omega is the approximate GCD of R1 and R2. So let's compute it. We start uh, running the usual Euclidean algorithm. So we have two integers and we want to compute the greatest common divisor. So we divide the largest integer by the smallest with the remainder. And so here we just subtract R1 minus R2 and we get this. So now, of course, um, the result is going to be less than R2. But statistically, so this remainder will be uniformly distributed on uh, the interval from uh, 0 to R2. So this means that on average, so the value of R3 will be half of uh, the value of R2. And indeed, uh, so we see that, um, well, R3 is of course uh, lower than R2, but it has uh, just one order of magnitude lower, where we just um, take orders of magnitudes by powers of 2. So when we compute R4, so the same thing happens. So we drop down by one order of magnitude. And then approximately, so with each time we compute the remainder, we drop down by one or perhaps two orders of, of magnitudes. And suddenly, when we come to R8. So here we drop by many orders of magnitude. So we go from 6,000 
down to 7. And uh, so this means that here we should uh, stop. So this means that uh, we should interpret this for because we are computing not exact greatest common divisor but approximate greatest common divisor. So here we should uh, uh, conclude that R8 is approximately equal to 0. And uh, so this will tell us that the approximate GCD of R1 and R2 is um, approximately equal to 6811. Now let us uh, check this. So let us see whether R1 and R2 are indeed multiples of 6811. So if we divide R1 and R2 by 6811, so then we get uh, the values uh, 63.98 and 36.98. So this tells us that omega for which R1 and R2 are presumably multiples is uh, slightly below this uh, value 6811. So this uh, means that omega is approximately equal to R1 over 64. So, so we can see that uh, R1 corresponds to the 64th peak of um, our Fourier coefficients. And uh, R2 is um, the peak number 37. And then we get the following value for omega. So our base frequency, so here we see that uh, our base frequency is not necessarily an integer. And uh, so this is the approximate value for the base frequency as we can derive from this approximate GCD computation. And uh, so then finally m, which is uh, equal to 2 to the power of 20 over omega. So this is approximately um, 2 to the power of 20 divided by 68. 08.92 and this is uh, 154.0003 something. And uh, so what we see is uh, that from this calculation we conclude that uh, the order of our element is uh, 154. So this is uh, order of g. So in this way, we are able to obtain the order of an element in this multiplicative group with uh, this modulus. Uh, and uh, so if we do this for several elements in this group, then uh, we can determine the order of this group and uh, then we can obtain the factorization. So in this particular case, we know that m over little m is an integer and it's slightly less than n over m. And so this is 989 divided by 154. So this is approximately 6.4. So from here we conclude that m over m is equal to 6. And uh, so then capital M is uh, 6 times 154, so which is um, so uh, 924. And this integer is uh, p minus 1 times q minus 1, so which is um, equal to pq minus p plus q plus 1. And uh, so PQ is uh, equal to N. So it's 989 minus P plus Q plus 1. So from here we conclude that P plus Q is uh, equal to um, 990 minus uh, 924. So this is 66. And then we form a quadratic equation. We write x squared minus 66x plus 989 is equal to 0. 
And uh, then we just use the quadratic formula for solving this equation. So x is equal to 66 plus minus square root of 66 squared minus 4 times 989 over 2. And uh, from here we get that p is equal to 43 and q is equal to 23. So from this quadratic equation we can uh, determine our factors, prime factors uh, p and q. So this is uh, Shor's algorithm. So we can see that Shor's algorithm has um, two essential ingredients. One ingredient is the ability of quantum computers to run massively parallel classical computations. And the second ingredient is the possibility of uh, running quantum Fourier transform, which is, uh, has very efficient complexity. And so we see that the overall complexity of uh, Shor's algorithm is n squared, where n is the number of bits, so which is uh, quadratic and uh, way, way better than any classical algorithm for integer factorization that we know. With availability of quantum computers, so RSA cryptosystem as well as uh, most other public key cryptosystems that are used today for internet security. So uh, all of these will become insecure, but uh, of course uh, one has to reach a certain level. So we need quantum computers that uh, can operate with sufficient number of quantum bits. From Shor's algorithm we see that the number of quantum bits that we need is uh, three times the bit size of the integer that we need to factor. Well, maybe four times uh, if we want to also incorporate some extra memory for auxiliary computations for the classical step. Uh, so currently we are not there yet, so we don't have uh, quantum uh, computers that are able uh, to handle so many quantum bits, but uh, certainly the progress uh, in this area is uh, rather significant. And there are reasons to believe that um, we might be able to construct quantum computers that are capable of breaking current public key cryptography.